32, so we'll call ourselves to order. Can you join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, please? Thank you. Roll call, please. Sorry. Eva Henry. Eric Hansen. Bill Holen. Here. Elise Jones. Deb Gardner. Dennis Harward. Here. Tim Moth. Tom Hayden. Christy Fanganello. Anthony Graves. Here. Chris Nevitt. Robin Kniech. Roger Partridge. Here. Gail Watson. Connie McLean. Don Rozier. Present. Bob Pfeiffer. Here. Bob Roth. Here. Sue Horn. Larry Vidham. David Spellman. Suzanne Jones. Here. Ann Justin. Here. Lynn Baca. Here. George Teal. Here. Kathy Noon. Here. Ron Engels. Catherine Hyder. Laura Crispin. Here. Gail Christie. Jim Benson. Here. Debbie Nasta. Joe Baker. Todd Riddle, Laura Keegan, Randy Penn. Good luck. <laughs> Don't make Booth. promises you can't keep. Yeah, Mark right. Ruber. Here. Joyce Thomas. Here. George Heath, Samantha Maring, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown. Here. Henry Ergot, Lynette Kelsey, Paula Bovo, Doris Ragoni, Sersha Karis Graves. Here. Ron Rakowski. Here. Mike Hillman. Brad Weasley. Here. Shakti. Tom Quinn. Here. Jerry Bean. Phil Cernanek. Present. Jackie Malay. Jim Gunning. Gabe Santos. Jeff Moore. Ashley Stolzman. Here. John O'Brien. Here. Colleen Whitlow. Here. Deborah Jerome. Here. Chris Larson. Joe Gearlock. Joyce Downing. Here. John Dyack. Gary Howard, Here. Rita Dozel, Deborah Williams, Val Vigil, Herb Atchison, Here. Joyce J, Bud Starker, Simon Tafoya, Deborah Perkins Smith, Here. Bill Van Meter. Okay, okay we do have a quorum. Uh, we do have. Um, Four new board members or alternates in hearing the roll. I don't think that the roll call, I'm not sure that any of them are here, but just in case, uh, Debbie Nasta from Decono and Joe Baker from Decono, Lynette Kelsey from Georgetown, and Deb Gardner from Boulder County. <laughs> All right, thanks. So, Deb, if you could just wave your hand. She's a new alternate from Boulder County. Okay, item four is a motion to approve the agenda. Can I have a motion, please? So moved. Second? Second. Moved and seconded. All in favor, say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Abstain? Motion carries. Item five is a public hearing. And I have a little script here. Uh, you have the substitute substitute tonight. So um, good evening. Um, my name is Bob Roth. I'm the representative from Aurora and the secretary of the Denver Regional Council of Governments. I want to thank you for coming tonight. This evening, the Denver Count, uh, Regional Council of Governments is holding a public hearing on the draft of the 2016 through 2021 Transportation Improvement Program, or TIP, and the Companion Air Quality Conformity uh, Determination Documents. This public hearing of the Denver Regional Council of Go Governments is hereby convened. The purpose of this hearing is to provide an opportunity for those who are interested in the draft of the 2016 through 2021 tip 
to provide comments to the board. No decisions will be made and no actions will be taken tonight related to this public hearing. Receiving public comment is important to the board's decision-making process. Anyone wishing to speak should have either registered on the sign-in sheets located on the table at the reception area or should have previously made a request to speak through the Dr. Cog website or by phone. All comments via email, website, or in writing are automatically included in the public hearing record. Any comments received prior to this meeting have been provided to the board. If you wish to submit written testimony to be included in the official record of the hearing, please give it to the secretary after you speak. Board members are free to ask questions of all those who testify. Todd Cottrell of Dr. Cog staff will now summarize the draft of 2016 through 2021 tip. Thank you and good evening. I'm, my name is Todd Cottrell, Senior Transportation Planner with the Denver Regional Council of Governments. The 2016-2021 Transportation Improvement Program, or TIP, allocates, let's do this, allocates funding to projects over the next six years, contains projects not only by Dr. Cog, but by CDOT and RTD as well. Each of these agencies has its own funding source and project allocation process. These projects through a TIP amendment process are at either added, deleted, or modified almost on a monthly basis. This map outlines not only just the Dr. Cog area, but also outlines the MPO boundary in blue. There's two additional areas outside of this boundary that are eligible for CMAC funding only in the shaded areas. The TIP contains approximately $3.7 billion worth of projects at this time. Um, in the orange shaded is $267 million, which was allocated by Dr. Cog. The remaining will go to CDOT and CDOT funding, and this typically will increase as the TIP years progress. This map outlines all of the mappable projects contained within the TIP. Um, the two exceptions are CDOT pool projects and any region-wide projects. So a little bit more detail on the Dr. Cog development process. This is, takes approximately 18 months. This tip up, the, begins with the TIP policy development. This started back in November of 2013 and concluded um, this last July. Um, following this summer by the uh, call for projects, which was open approximately for two months. This last fall in 2014, there was the project selection process, which was finalized uh, this January of 2015. And finally tonight, we arrive at the public hearing and hopeful adoption of this document in, in the next month. Each of these steps involves multiple um, committees, including the, the board of directors. This pie chart uh, shows the allocation of Dr. Cog funding in the first and second phases. Uh, the roadway capacity, operations, and reconstruction is approximately 70%, followed by bike and pet at 21%, and followed by transit and studies. And finally, the remaining adoption schedule. This coming Monday, the Transportation Advisory Committee will make a recommendation to RTC, which will take a look at the document and recommend to the board in, in uh, April. One month from today, uh, the board will take this document up for adoption, followed by, um, in May, the State Transportation Improvement Program will be included, the TIP will be included within that document. Be happy to take any questions that you may have. Questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you, Mr. Cottrell. The hearing is now open for those uh, who have signed up to speak. I will note for the record, uh, it was mentioned in the open, but we did receive one written notice uh, of information from a Mr. Shepner, and that will be in the record as part of the public comment. Each speaker will have up to three minutes to testify. If you've not finished by the end of the three minutes, I'll ask you to conclude your remarks. When you hear your name called, please approach the microphone area and present your testimony. At this time, I only have one person who signed up, uh, Gerard Frank. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. 
Um, my name is Gerard Frank. I live in Denver. And I uh, have the honor to tell you that I was the first chairperson of the Transportation and Energy Committee in the Colorado House of Representatives. <laughs> this occurred back in the age of the dinosaurs. <laughs> only uh, only a, a few of you actually remember that, or could possibly remember that. Um, I was also a member of a Dr. Cog committee in the past. I represented Lakewood on the Dr. Cog Housing Committee in 1968 or 69. That's a long time ago. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the board, some of you are old enough, but all of you should know or be familiar with the date, December 7th, 1941, a date that lives in infamy. There's another date that lives in infamy around the intersection of Colfax and Sheridan. It's December 3rd, 2014. On that date, my friend and neighbor, um, Alice Johnson, was, was killed trying to cross 17th and uh, Sheridan. Since then, in the 90 days following that, 92 days to be precise, two more people have been killed in traffic accidents. Numerous other people have been hurt at the same intersection at 17th and Sheridan. I'm going to get the numbers and we'll have an opportunity, to, I hope, to, to present them to you. But this is a deadly intersection. And it has been, apparently, for many years since I've gotten involved in this. I've heard numerous stories. I have a reason to believe that something like one person has been killed there each each um, uh, month. So uh, I, I no notice that there's a sidewalk project in your, in your plan. That's very nice, but it doesn't come close to taking care of the, the numerous problems. I have gotten the legislature involved and the merchants in the area and the generally merchants in the area involved. I can promise you we will be coming back to pester you, if need be, about putting some money into that project. We can't wait until 2021. We're going to ask for some funding to take care of the immediate problem right now. There's much more to be done, and we will uh, make proposals of that. We I expect to hire a transportation planner, a lawyer, and some st a little bit of staff to help us with this. And we're going to have a bigger proposal uh, to give to you, but that is um, that will cost a little bit more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Frank. Is there anyone else that did not have a chance to sign up but would like to speak to this issue? Any questions or comments from the board? Seeing none. This brings pu tonight's public hearing to a close. Thank you for your testimony and your interest. The board is currently scheduled to take action on the draft 2016-2021 tip on April 15th. <coughs> Next item is item six, Sustainable Communities Initiative. Paul? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Hi, everybody. Um, so what we're going to talk about tonight is the outcomes assessment and knowledge sharing task from the Sustainable Communities Initiative. Um, I just wanted to remind you that this is one of the prime tasks in the grant, um, whereas the regional planning and the corridor planning and the catalytic project tasks were all focused on doing projects and learning from the outcomes of those projects. The Outcomes and Assessment and Knowledge Sharing Task, euphemistically called OAKS, not quite a great acronym, um, is really about learning from the experience we already have in the region in the corridors that have already opened, the southeast, southwest, and west corridors, and to look at the experience in other regions and learning from the best practices and experience in all of those areas and applying that to moving forward in the Denver region. 
So uh, with no further ado, although I'm, I do want to mention one more thing. If you haven't already gotten on your schedule, April 7th, the final consortium meeting and celebration for the completion of the SCI grant. Not going to give you all the logistics because you either have received or will be receiving your invitation to that event, but please mark that morning off on your calendar to attend. We hope to have a lot of fun. Ah, it's on the table. Gosh, that's probably because of Ashley Cotty, my colleague who's always on top of these things. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce the Oaks team who will introduce themselves. Uh, Carrie? Good evening. I'm Carrie McCarrowitz. I'm an assistant urban planning professor at the University of Colorado Denver in the College of Architecture and Planning. And it's been our privilege to work on this project for about the last nine months. Um, as Paul said, this is the Outcomes Assessment and Knowledge Sharing Project. And a major goal of that project was to understand how do we bring more riders to the stations, these wonderful stations that RTD has been building for the last several decades with more stations about to come on the line. So planners, we have looked at this for years and we've decided that if you're going to bring riders to the station, we've seen this through research, you need to have more housing that can, so people can live there, you need better accessibility so people can get there, more jobs so people work there, and lastly, inviting, attractive, con um, welcoming places so people not a, who do live and work there want to use transit. So given those four areas that we were asked to t t uh, take on, we devised a research scheme that would allow us to look at, get, hear a number of perspectives, but also use existing data that's out there and then collect a lot of new data from on the ground by going and visiting the station areas. And we took a three-prong approach. So our first pro approach was to actually go visit those station areas and devise a scoring mechanism on a variety of factors so that we could have some way of judging consistently across the stations how they're doing. And we looked at all 45 of the existing on those four areas. And then we went and interviewed 64 people with a range of expertise in all three sectors. So you can see up there that we talked to developers, planners, financiers, the workforce boards, um, community organizers, elect economic development agencies, elected officials. And then lastly, we decided to look outside the region uh, as part of our task that we were asked to do. And we did an extensive analysis first to decide which three regions we should choose. And we ended up with Dallas, Portland, and San Diego. And so these regions are both similar and different from us. They're similar in that Two of them are considered our economic competitors and one's not, but San Diego is in a state that has been doing extensive TOD planning um, as a state for all the regions throughout the state for a number of years. Um, we also wanted to pick stationary, uh, regions that had similar light rail technology to us as well as new systems. So we gathered from those three t techniques loads of information that we could then contrast by what did we see, what did we hear, what did we dig up through the data. And to begin, I'm just going to present some of those findings tonight. But let's look at population. So right now we have about 5% of the region's population on just 3% of the land area in those, of those 45 station areas. An important point to remember about this is a million people in our region currently cannot drive a car by themselves. So that includes children, seniors, people with different abilities that allow them to drive, may not allow them to drive, people who don't have cars. Um, and so that number is going to be able to grow based on some of the other factors I'm going to show you. Then we looked at jobs. Currently, jobs are at a denser level in the station areas than population. We've got 30% of the jobs on just that 3% of the land area. And when we open up the new lines in the next year and to three years, it's going to jump up to 35% of the jobs on just 4% of the land area. So this is both a factor of the lines being built where we already had jobs and people, as well as jobs and people coming to those stations once they, once they open. So a little bit of cause and effect as well as good planning on where RTD was able to put the lines. And we also analyzed then, okay, if this, that's how many people or jobs are in the station areas, is there room to hold more? And many of you probably know that there is. Um, just looking at a, a single metric beyond what else we looked at for this, um, just 
uh, a number of them have less than seven dwelling units per acre. And if you see from that chart up there, that's an, uh, a, dwell a number of, that's a density that's not very transit supportive. But it also indicates on a positive way that we have room for growth. Um, So we didn't only look at just that raw density number because that's not always indicative because maybe a station area is mostly industrial or mostly business and we also took that into account. We categorize all these station areas by the type of TOD that they are. We recognize that they're not, it's not a one size fits all. We need to, we need it to look at them individually too. And we devised, as I mentioned earlier, a scoring mechanism where we put together a number of criteria so that we could consistently systematically rate them on how they were doing. And so in, st in terms of station development, the chart on the, I guess that's your right, um, it shows how they ranked, but the, the variables on the left are the things we looked at. We looked at how the station was designed, if there were major attractions in the station area, if the uses were segregated or more mixed and integrated, so you could walk from one type of thing to the other very you know, easily. Um, whether or not they had public amenities, if the zoning was supportive for the type of transit uh, supportive communities, from our site visits, how was the vibrancy and the utilization of the station that day, um, and then also whether or not the community had any sub-area or TOD-specific plans for that. And out of the 45, we found that 10 have not created such a plan. Um, because of what we found through this analysis and what we heard in the interviews in terms of there being more land to develop, but it was being, it's difficult to develop currently because of the lack of amenities and infrastructure and services that are there and it, it raises the development costs as well as, the, well as the development time and a lot of the local governments don't have the funding to provide that extra infrastructure that hasn't been there to the level that would be needed for TOD. Um, and this makes it especially hard for affordable housing. So the map on the left shows the number of subsidized units per stationary and we found, um, I think it's tw 12 that don't have any subsidized units. Most of the subsidized units are in the Denver station areas. But beyond that, we didn't only look at subsidy, subsidized units in terms of ranking a station in terms of affordability. We looked at what mix of incomes can currently afford to live there. What are they paying for housing? Is it, a two, is it beyond the typical burden of 30%? Was there a good share of rental units since that's more affordable? Um, what's the density in the area since that can also lower cost of development when you're sharing land costs across many units? Units. And the end result for that ended up being most station areas on our scoring method are out of balance in terms of affordable housing. Um, a number are in our middle category, 28%, and then a few are performing well on these criteria. And this is important given the recent study by uh, Housing Colorado that 58,000 units is our shortage in affordable housing right now in the region. Um, we also looked at the site development. If you were walking in the station area, if you want to build in the station area, how well and accessible is the station area? And so I won't read through all of these. I'll let you look at them. But um, we looked both at the immediate station area as well as the larger half mile walking distance around the station um, that would contribute to uh, our scoring method and how well we could say these station areas are doing. So transit, vibrancy, amenities, wayfinding, if we felt safe or not, and safe in both terms of traffic safety and personal safety. And during those walks when we were out there, we ended up walking 131 miles in order to go to every station and walk from three points out and into the station from the half mile area. And those, the, the red, yellow, and green line shows how we judge those walks on our way into the station. And that added up to being 62% um, of them needing improvement, but 38% of them being good. And we could get to the stations from three different points, so that's also a positive, even though some of the walks might have not have been as pleasant or safe or direct as we would have liked. So that wraps up just a, a touch of the research that I want to share today, and I'm going to turn the recommendations based on all of those findings over to Rocky. Thanks, Before Gary. we do that, are there any questions on the presentation? Mayor Atchison. Thank you, Chairman. The question I, I'm interested in is because so many stations are in the construction phase right now and coming online next year, would the results of your study have been skewed a lot differently if you had t gone and looked at those stations or at least the plans for those stations, which shows you the outline construction that's planned for those? Oh, so we, we to. Are, we looked at the 
existing lines as well as the future lines separately. So the extensive analysis was focused on the existing lines that are not under construction right now. So the southeast, southwest, west, and central. Um, and then the new lines, we didn't do that same type of analysis. We were looking at those more in terms of the planning phase, and that was mostly through our interviews. Okay, because my concern is that because so many stations, especially north of I-70, are currently going through uh, construction phases and are planned to open in the first part of next year, plus some DI-225 stations out to DIA. I'm just concerned that we're seeing a much smaller number than I would have expected to see in some of those percentages about what's being planned as far as housing, uh, accessibility oh. and stuff. So that's my concern that we okay. have a skewed number. The, the, I only quoted a percentage of jobs for the future lines uh, rather than population, and that was just existing jobs. So that doesn't include the plan. That would have been an interesting find, uh, thing to include is if we included planned jobs and housing units rather than relying on the census data of who currently lives and works there. It would have showed a different number in terms of future jobs. All right, thank you. Other questions? Seeing none? Rocky? Yeah. Thank you. Wow, so it's a uh, delight to be here uh, with you. Welcome back. Uh, it's, uh, it is. I'm uh, enjoying being back here this evening. It doesn't seem that long ago that I, I was last here. And uh, have to say, I mean, so much a privilege to have spent time with you working on issues here, planning for the future. And uh, this project in particular, I think, again, is one of the amazing collaborative things this region has done to really, I mean, shift paradigms and be a game changer here for how we become a real robust 21st uh, century urban region here. So currently I'm working as uh, interim uh, executive director for the Colorado Center for Sustainable Urbanism. This is a new center being launched at the uh, University of Colorado Denver and I'd welcome an opportunity to come back and talk about the center sometime and, and some of the work we're doing. We're really emphasizing uh, areas of collaboration, areas of how we grow uh, more uh, intelligently, I'll use that word just very bluntly here, around issues of housing, making sure we have housing for all, and again, improving mobility uh, for our residents as well. as well. As Carrie said, you know, we've got a uh, big gap here in this region of a population of three million, about one million people don't have access to automobiles, and we are uh, seeing that we're making a lot of progress on that front here. But my charge this evening, and I know our time's limited, is to talk about recommendations that are coming along uh, as part of this uh, study and report. We'll be finishing this up in mid-April, so I wanted to give you that timeline. And uh, soon after that, this will be packaged with a lot of the other work that you've been overseeing with the Sustainable Communities uh, Initiative and become a resource that we hope is just only the beginning of a lot of good planning and development to happen around station areas here. So I'm charged with talking about recommendations. Before I get into them, let me just say uh, they're evidence-based. So that was one of the tasks we had uh, with the university is to do uh, research that really was kind of unbiased and maybe a little separated from particular agendas and so on, just to give you a lot of good information in terms of what's happening now and what could happen. So the recommendations are really uh, twofold. I think uh, they're a call to action, if you will, of uh, things we can do to be even more successful with that $7 billion investment that we've made uh, with the fast track system. And doubly, I mean, this is one of the things we've done a lot with our colleagues, with Dr. Cog, uh, the staff here, you know, how this really helps to reinforce a lot of the uh, policy commitment that you've made with uh, the whole Metro Vision process and to ensure that that's successful. So besides recommendations, which are really talking about things that we can do, opportunities and so on, we've got actions uh, that are specific uh, implementation steps to take to actually be uh, successful. And again, we're drawing on things that we're already doing in the region. Uh, so that's great. There's a lot of good work happening that we'll talk about here in a minute, but also things we've learned from our peer regions and from other research that we've done here. So uh, the actions are really critical. They talk about responsibility. So I've just said we, d we have a call to action here, but ask this group maybe to relax a little bit. We're not putting everything on Dr. Cog's shoulders here with our recommendations. So they do talk about different things that uh, 
could be happening with different responsible parties, whether that's with local jurisdictions, with the development community, uh, with other agencies, as well as some things that Dr. Cog should consider kind of convening uh, stakeholders and so on and help to kind of design a path forward. And then finally, measure. So we've taken a lot of time to, to draw into this whole program. Uh, what information do, do we need to know whether we're being successful? And so those quickly are in two groups. So one are a set of implementation measures. So are we doing the things we said we'd do? Uh, and then secondly, performance. I mean, are they giving us the results we wanted? So Kerry, for example, talked a little bit about some of the lumpiness of how easy it is to walk in some of the station areas. So are we making investments to make walking, bicycling, using local transit and so on better? And then again, in terms of performance, I mean, is that helping station areas attract the jobs and housing that we'd like to see there? So let me go through these. We've got 19 recommendations. Uh, we're open to putting a 20th one in to be even. So if you've got some ideas and suggestion, uh, suggestions, send them our way. Uh, and we've worked with these same categories that Carrie introduced initially. So some recommendations deal with housing, some with the accessibility issues, some specifically around economic development and jobs, some around those site development opportunities. But a whole lot of them are, are what we're using the term general. I mean, they're cross-cutting. They're things that we do that will help all of these things. They'll help housing, they'll help accessibility, they'll help jobs. And so I'm just going to go through them quickly with you uh, th uh, this evening. And again, as we get the final material out to you, you know, we're very open and welcome to either coming back or spending time with you in your jurisdictions uh, or with you one-on-one -on -one, uh, for more information. So number one, we've learned how important it is with collaboration. Again, we've got some amazing examples here in our region already, but with our case studies, we've seen that uh, where they have been able to bring different parties and partners together, whether it's various public entities or public-private partnerships and so on, they are much more successful in getting uh, robust development to happen in and around station areas. Second one, I mean, we debated what word to use. Holistic is kind of a word we planners like to throw around a little bit, so our apologies there. But it's just saying we need to do something that's comprehensive and integrates everything. I mean, we have gone through and have a history of dealing with housing here, transportation there, uh, economy somewhere else, and we're saying where this works best is where you take an integrated approach and bring all of those things into play and you're factoring all of them. I mean, if you're dealing with completing your mobility network in a center, you are creating the opportunity to, to better attract real estate uh, investments uh, as well as uh, economic investments here. Third, treat your station as a whole community. So um, we want to make sure that there's kind of complete housing, housing for all interests. And I know we've talked with you before, I'm going to mention it here in a minute, about our changing demographics and changes happening in the housing market that we see happening now, not just what we're thinking is going to be happening a decade from now here. And also the issue of these complete mobility choices. So again, that all of those are in play, and that these truly are places in which to live, work, and play here. Streamline development review. There's another one where we've got some very good examples here, where jurisdictions have done kind of advanced planning and the typical things that they put on the shoulders of developers to kind of plan and develop. They're saying, hey, we've worked those issues out already. If you're bringing in a project that kind of was within this context here, we can um, get you through the process cleaner. You're bringing in transit-oriented development. Let's get that on the ground. Managing parking in station areas is a huge one we heard in the interview. So that's a big issue here. And uh, we've got uh, a menu of things we're developing in terms of recommendations of how places can deal with that uh, in the future. Uh, plan for and connect station areas with your adjacent neighborhoods and centers. So, you know, your station areas aren't moated or walled, uh, that they have a relationship with the neighborhoods immediately adjacent to them. And uh, again, in terms of walkability and access from communities and districts immediately adjacent to the station, into the station area and to the platform. I mean, that's important to look at that too. And that capture area then becomes really significant. So even though we're talking 
a three to four percent area of the total land area in the urban region being station areas. I mean, when you start to look at this broadly in terms of the capture area there, I mean, we're talking about capturing uh, really hundreds of thousands of people in, in, um, in the region and, and making travel and mobility better for them. Prioritize first and last mile connections. We've talked about that. I that, uh, appreciate that Carrie uh, gave you one example here. One thing that is a charge, I would say, to your board and, and to Dr. Cog here is how do we mesh uh, the center's concept in Metro Vision with what we're doing with station areas? And I'll just say that really simply. So we've got urban centers that have station areas. We have urban centers that don't have stations in them. And we have centers that aren't in urban uh, centers, or stations that aren't in urban centers. So I think that's something to look at when you develop the center's concept that was pre-fast tracks and so on. So this is a new dimension uh, to, to work with and, and look at for future planning and uh, investment purposes. Establish a real estate acquisition program. So this is something, again, we see in some of our peer regions is done through the uh, regional transit uh, authority there, but in many instances it's local jurisdictions or local jurisdictions in partnership with, um, with uh, quasi-governmental entities or uh, other groups that are uh, housing advocates, so uh, another one of our recommendations. Leverage funding and identify new funding for housing. So what we've heard again and again and again is a strong interest in developing housing for all sectors of, uh, of the housing market here, but there isn't always funding for some of those sectors, and in many instances, it's hard for uh, market rate developers to pencil out uh, providing a full range of, of housing opportunities here. And as Kerry noted, you know, we're seeing, not just with our own research, but what we're seeing from other partners here, I mean, we have a growing housing gap in, in this region, and all the indications are it's going to continue to grow. Changing demographics, quickly, what we call the four S's in planning terms, single person homes, so that's a growing part of the market, just one person living in a home. Startups, so young folks just entering the housing market. Single parent households is growing phenomenally as, as uh, a part of uh, the whole housing landscape, uh, not just here in Denver, Colorado, but uh, nationally, and then seniors. So what are we doing to ensure that uh, our home products and so on are meeting their needs and, and, uh, and uh, interests here? A regional approach for housing. So we've seen it in Portland. We've seen it in San Diego. Uh, we're seeing Dallas making a commitment to it and something to talk about here. I mean, there's a lot of different ways and directions where this could go, uh, but, you know, it's easy to say, unlike some other urban regions where you may have two or three different center nodes, like Minneapolis, St. Paul, or Seattle, where I came from, where we had Everett, Seattle, Tacoma, Bremerton, and so on. I mean, we're a unified housing market here for all intents and purposes, so uh, that is something that uh, suggests uh, a regional approach. As we talked about leveraging funding for um, housing, also for infrastructure. So we heard again and again and again from folks the need for sidewalks, uh, more complete types of roadways that accommodate all users, bicycle access. Uh, I mean, a lot of people are, thank you very much, Dr. Cog, for uh, including that uh, in uh, the transportation improvement program significantly uh, each cycle, but more is needed to really uh, make that, uh, those centers uh, complete places, those station areas. Leverage, market, uh, leverage and market transit-oriented development is our next one. I mean, we're hearing this isn't uh, kind of an afterthought or kind of an anomaly in, in our urban world these days. I mean, there's a real market and appetite by people. Uh, we often kind of stereotype, particularly young people and millennialists want the kind of lifestyle that you have uh, in a station area. So I mean, that's there. So let's capture that and um, use it as, as a catalyst, not just for getting development in these places, but again, to making them robust places with prosperous economies here. Fair structure. So we heard a lot from folks here, and some of the research in our paper shows how we deal with fares here in the Denver region does differ significantly from what they do in Dallas, San Diego, and Portland. 
uh, and again, uh, how do we maybe look at that in a manner that really helps to grow the ridership that we want for people to use this investment, as well as issues around equity here. And then the last set of these, uh, education and outreach. So we know some of this stuff is, is novel for some folks, for other folks. Uh, I mean, they've been in the trenches with this for a decade or more. But uh, particularly as these new stations come on, uh, online here, I mean, that's just kind of a new experience for many of our citizens. And, and so what is it all about and why are we talking about a little different uh, type of housing form and so on that uh, they may be living in or are used to? Uh, and uh, again, some of these other benefits and how e even if you're not living in the centers we talked about before, uh, it can be something that really enhances your quality of life as well. Monitoring, so again, uh, how are we doing? And uh, there's a little bit in planning uh, that uh, we use the, the concept, do it, try it, fix it. I mean, so we've made this investment, is it working? Where is it working, where is it not? And I mean, use that information to say, okay, let's, let's maybe do some mid-course corrections or bring some other factors in here to really achieve what we want to with our goals and objectives. We've also heard from people, it's not too soon. I mean, we're ahead of the game a little bit with some of our corridors, but we're also playing catch up a little bit. And we know that in Metro Vision, uh, you've already outlined potential future corridors. You don't necessarily have the technology worked out in terms of what they'll be. But I mean, let's go ahead and start doing some of that advanced planning for other lines that may eventually join the fast track system here so that they're prepared once that investment comes into their uh, parts of the region that uh, we can go forward with that. And then finally, a uh, best practices toolkit. So again, uh, a place where it's a repository for information on much of what we've talked about, the housing practices that uh, we know work well in station areas, the accessibility uh, investments that we've talked about, economic development, and again, ways to go forward with site development. So that's uh, the end of my part of the presentation, and uh, turn it back over to the chair. Thank you. Any questions? questions for Rocky? Mr. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a brief question for you, Rocky. Nice to see you. Nice to by see the way. you, Anthony. Yeah. Uh, when you talked a little bit about reviewing the fare structure to grow ridership, can you uh, share just a couple more details about that research? Yeah, let me say a few things, and I know Carrie did a lot of the research with Maybe I'll just turn it over to Carrie because she's uh, totally informed. <laughs> well, um, I did a number of the interviews of, along with Randy Harrison, who's back in, in the back of the room. and. Really what we're saying is we heard over and over again in our interviews from um, the private sector, from the public sector, the, no the nonprofit, that fares are an issue for their employees, for their housing residents, for their citizens in their, in their towns. And so we, given that there's already a fare study going on and a lot of people weighing in on that and studying it, we didn't take on that uh, challenge as well to figure out what the proper fare structure would be. But the bottom line was that fares are too high for a lot of people. Um, even people who you would think could afford them, who are in the $75,000 and above um, range, so who are above the median income in the region, are not using transit bec partially because the monthly pass would be too expensive. They weigh it against the time and um, their ability to use a car, and the car wins out. And unfortunately, we do find that in a lot of cases when people choose a car over transit. Um, I don't own a car, <laughs> so I, I make that decision. But I know that it's, it's harder if you have kids and you live in an area that's less walkable or you're going a further distance. But a lower fare would tip the, the, the decision for some people um, and make it easier for them to use it more often, too. Also, better connectivity in terms of fares and transfer times with bus and rail. Um, and again, I just want to stress that it was mostly through our interviews we heard this and that we heard it from across the board, the economic development agencies that are attracting the Fortune 500 companies to try to have an office in our town, in, in our region, to pe housing authorities. Mayor Cernanek. Yes. Uh, thank you, Rocky and Kerry. Um, it, it's more a, uh, a question as you get to implementation steps around the recommendations. Yeah. Um, 
a couple things. One, we are not a uh, housing planning organization for the region. Uh, there doesn't exist one, uh, if you have some thoughts uh, around that. And then to make it uh, even more um, uh, complex, um, when you get down to the local uh, transit station and speeding up the development review uh, often ends up with uh, tripping over the connect to the neighborhoods uh, mm -hmm. issue at the local level. Yeah. And uh, what have you seen at those levels? Because you, you can come in with some very nice uh, theoretical approaches, mm -hmm. but till you get to the actual when you're on the ground, how do you deal with those things? Because yeah. you, you have some conflicts. So again, I think we're seeing, and, and there's a lot of different models where there are approaches to regional housing. I mean, there's no one set formula. I mean, sometimes there is a regional entity. Sometimes it's an entity that parallels you. It's a, a Dr. Cog type of entity that has assumed that function. So what we're saying is this issue transcends borders. It's a related issue for all jurisdictions. And so something needs to happen regionally. I think what we're suggesting is, uh, again, this doesn't necessarily need to rest, uh, become a new uh, issue area for this organization, but you're probably the right place to start to convene folks and to work on what that might look like and, and how you might organize it and go forward. So uh, that's what we're saying with that. On the issue of, yeah, maybe streamlining and does that trip up, uh, I could just share some, some personal experience. So in Seattle, and it took us about 20 years to get there with this, so hopefully if this is something that Denver area jurisdictions uh, see appealing, you, you, you can do it a little, little quicker. But what they basically did was develop a pre-plan that again addressed a lot of issues that typically get put on to developers. So again, this could be issues such as um, what are you know what do you typically ask a developer to invest in for like sidewalk and street improvements and some of those things, and a lot of those decisions are made ahead of time, and they are through a planning process that is often nested in your comprehensive plan. So you've taken care of a lot of the public input that the community sees this as something they value, something that's adopted by your jurisdiction's legislative authority. So uh, again, it, it's kind of uh, just an additional step. So I use the term, uh, it was a prime the pump sort of uh, planning document that we would do. So uh, is that enough of an answer? So For now. Okay. And I can talk to you more about some of the specifics and details that might go into that. Mayor Atchison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want, I want to go back to Carrie's comment, if you don't mind. And this is re regarding the FAIR study. Uh, we're going through that FAIR review right now with RTD. They've started the public hearings this month. They'll be going on. The board makes the decision on May. And they're going from a multi-level FAIR structure down to basically four. But I think some of the same things that you just mentioned are what we're already hearing is the inequity in the fares between rail and bus, the cost from the day pass to the regional pass to the local pass is causing a lot of people to get out of the transit system and get back into cars. But for all of us who have the opportunity to provide comments on this study, it behooves our staff to make sure that we get comments in because otherwise we're going to get stuck with whatever they hand us. And we're not going to see the resolution that we want out of getting people off cars and onto transit. And then that's going to make our job here at Dr. Cog even worse. But we're seeing a big shift right now of the proposed fares already starting to have an effect to driving people back to cars. As you indicated, it's happening already. Commissioner Holan. Uh, Rocky, this might be. <clears throat> Uh, an issue that's that's related to the to the current to the uh, past economic recession, mm -hmm. but we're finding in a lot of the the TODs that we we have within the county, we're not attracting um, the level of interest from developers that we anticipated, and I think this is a serious issue because uh, a lot of these include uh, plans for um, uh, low low uh, low rent areas. Uh, uh, 
and um, mixed use kind of uh, impacts on the t TODs. Um, it's a major concern uh, for counties because of the investment that we involve and in, in how, and, and of course it reflects upon the cities as well. Uh, can you kind of address that and, and look look a little bit into the future and see <laughs> see if we're just going to have stations with nothing attached to them? Yeah. One thing I'll, I'll say, uh, and again, I mean, this might be something where we'd welcome maybe coming and talk, talking with you in more detail. I mean, it's one thing I, I say, uh, you know, I think the whole package of recommendations we're talking about, you know, I know it, it's complex, it, they kind of overlap and things like that. And really, I mean, a lot of it needs to happen. So there isn't any, like, magic bullet if you just do this one. You know, if you better market the thing, uh, you'll, you'll get it. Or if you find a way to get the uh, uh, transportation infrastructure up to snuff, uh, then uh, uh, that will help with uh, it. So it's, uh, it's, it's not, simp it's not a, as simplistic yeah. as we assumed in the, in it the early stages. Uh -huh. uh, build it and they will come. Well, you build it and they don't come, yeah. then we have a problem. So uh, again, I'll, I'll talk a little bit uh, about experience, and, and I think this is something we're already in the game here a little bit and probably know. I mean, this isn't something where you build the station or you designate the center, and then all of a sudden they start to come. Yeah, there was just 100,000 people just sitting over the hill there waiting for you to do that, and, and plump, here, here they come. I mean, a lot needs to happen, and I mean, there's no one sequence uh, where you say this is the step do step one two three four and and you get there so I mean uh, each place is unique and has its own issues some places we know there needs to be a lot of public investment first so um, again I've seen some of the communities in the Seattle area I mean they invested they moved their library into the center you know they maybe moved their city hall into the center I mean things like that so there were major investments like that on the part of the local jurisdiction before you started to have the private sector come. Or there was a catalytic private sector project. It might start with like a hotel and small convention place that was more localized for, uh, you know, not big deal gatherings, but uh, smaller uh, events and, and conventions and so on. And again, I mean, that might have been the first catalytic thing. Or it could be the housing. I mean, you start with housing, but it's a long time before you get the jobs. So um, we actually created a game that we used to sit and work with elected officials in the Sierra, Seattle area saying, how do you grow your station area? And you know, would do this and just give people all of the things you wanted. And it was fascinating to see. I mean, there is, there's no particular sequence for this. The other thing I would say is, uh, you know, I'm a long range planner. I'm kind of a patient person. And that's what this is about, too. I mean, we're talking about where you want to get 20 years from now. And you may have a period where it's kind of flat and plateau, and then it picks up and so on. Uh, so we, we, we see that a lot with these as well. And we've had some conversation. I'll just say this. I don't want to take too much of your time. I mean, when we talk about helping with some of the planning there, I mean, that is a challenge. Do you help the places that are already being successful be more successful? Or, I mean, do we put a lot of elbow grease and so on with the places that maybe aren't getting it? And what needs to happen there? And, I mean, maybe what does this body do to kind of help those places then uh, kind of catch up and give them the jump start they need to start seeing the success? Okay, I have Council Member Jones and then Commissioner Rozier. Uh, first off, I wanted to thank you for this great presentation. It's very thought-provoking. I also wanted to build on Mayor Atchison's comments um, about the RTD fare study and the bus rapid transit um, propo uh, service um, proposal that's being proposed for US 36 right now. Um, it was a matter I was going to bring up later for this group, but it touches on this, um, both that here we've invested mightily in inf uh, the bus rapid transit infrastructure, um, and yet you know, build it and they will come. Well, we need RTD to come. And what we're seeing is a cutback in the service level after this big in investment and also this fair inequity issue. Um, but another example is in Boulder, we've invested mightily in Boulder Junction, which is, which is a transit-oriented development at, I will say, great political cost to build uh, tall, tall buildings in Boulder. So it was controversial, but we're building it 
around an RTD station and the proposed service uh, schedule from RTD is to not even provide direct service to Union Station from there. So it touches on some of your principles of collaboration and um, making sure this all adds up because right now it's in danger of not adding up. And so I just wanted to touch on those issues and we're going to ask our colleagues here in this body to help support us in rectifying some of these issues. Um, so thank you for highlighting this. Commissioner Rozier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to jump on that same bandwagon, we saw firsthand in uh, Jefferson County with the opening of the W line a reduction, if not a cut, a uh, complete cut in service to the south part of the county. South part of the county that is now um, that we, we had bus service. We don't even have bus service up to the light rail station, the W, w line. And they replaced it with a call and ride system. A call and ride system of which we received our briefing yesterday in council that comes with a subsidy of up to $30 each way via a ride. Uh, um, the W line um, has not met expectations in ridership ratio. In fact, the W line from last year to this year is down 16% in ridership. So um, people are going, um, they're, they're viewing it as convenience in dollars. And when you look at the subsidies that are necessary, um, I have to ask, and I guess this is more of a uh, just a, a question here. Typically, you, you see density, and then you see this type of activity. Now we're, you know, build it, and what happens if they don't come? We have a big debt we need to pay, and they're barely even breaking uh, the, well, depends on what numbers you look at. They're right about 28% in their capture rate at the fare box. Hmm. That's not good sound business practice. The last report came out at 22, but it's unique uh, mathematics. We'll get them up to almost 30. <laughs> so um, it, it that's not good business practice right there. So um, we have a lot to overcome. We have a lot to, to look at in how we do things. Thank you. Council Member Stolzman. In Louisville, we saw a similar uh, thing to what Boulder's seen when we had the the rail transit, um, we rezoned an area of our city for mixed use, and the developers really wanted to build in Louisville, so the densities are higher, the parking ratios are lower, and it's a nice stop on a rail line that will be built in 2042. So now we have this transit-oriented development in our community with no transit, and so that's sort of another issue you can face, and so I think it's really important that we try to encourage transit to areas that are high density and have a lot of jobs and that we really focus on those first because otherwise you do what the mistake that we've done and we've actually created more traffic and more problems in an area that's not served by transit and won't be for a long time. Commissioner Henry. I, I also want to make sure that we all understand that, that it's a very slippery slope that, that we're starting to hit now. Um, for, for a long time one of the things that we have to realize is a lot of policies and a lot of federal policies focus on the urban areas and not on the suburban areas. Now they were saying there's three million people in the metro area and we're talking about focusing on the density areas which are the urban areas. Well there's only 600,000 people that actually live in urban areas. The other 2.5 million are the ones that live in the suburban areas. And those are the areas that have been built around the automobile because the suburban areas came around the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, and so on. So there's a lot of areas that still, um, North Glen is a good example, um, which doesn't really have the opportunity to, to have a real high density because it's already built out and it was built around the car. So we're actually excluding quite a few of our communities with transportation money if we start focusing on you know high density and I'm I'm all for high density and I love the bus and someday when I retire I hope to to live in a high density area so I can walk and my children don't have to worry about taking my car keys away <laughs> however right now the reality is you know I live in the suburban areas and so do my citizens and we really need to start figuring out how we can get 
mass transit into the suburban areas for one and two you know how would we even do high density in a suburban areas that have already been built out you're not already having that quirky conversation are you yeah until she realized she had to drive me everywhere and then she decided she didn't want that other questions or comments Mr. Aldretti, is there any wrap-up, or is that the conclusion? Uh, that's it. Uh, thank you very much. We'll be back next month, which will be our last presentation around SCI. Uh, members of the SCI Executive Committee will be here to talk about the outcomes and the principles that they've come up with based upon all of the research that's come out of SCI. So thank you very much. Again, urge you to attend the final consortium meeting and celebration with information in front of you <laughs> should just stick it on my forehead you know. um, and uh, thank you very much thank you all right the next item is item seven report of the chair we have three items on under that the first is the report on RTC uh, w with Doug Rex Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening, everyone. Um, the RTC and Regional Transportation Committee met yesterday, yesterday morning, and they acted on three items, two of which are on your, are on your consent agenda tonight, the first being um, a recommendation to allocate funds to purchase traffic signal uh, system equipment, and the, the second one was a recommendation to approve two TIP amendments, one from CDOT on I-25 North, and um, the second was a TIP amendment from RTD on the Colfax corridor. The the other action item that they they um, the other action the other item they took action on was a concurrence with an action that the board took last month on an amendment to the to the uh, TIP policy related to second year project delays. I'm sure you all will recall the the months of discussion we had on that. So um, so that that's it, Mr. Chairman. Questions or comments? Thank you very much. The other two items are appointments of a member and an alternate to represent Dr. Cog on two different boards. The first one is the STAC, the State Transportation Advisory Committee. Our current um, member and alternate are uh, Elise Jones and Jackie Malay, and they have both expressed interest in remaining as our representatives on that. Uh, so unless there, unless there is a nomination for somebody else from the floor I take a motion motion and second, second. All, all those in favor say aye. aye aye those opposed abstained thank you motion carries the second one is an alternate and a member to represent Dr. Cog on the E470 authority our current members who also have expressed interest Mayor rakowski has gone. We can do whatever we want. <laughs> the 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 two current members are uh, Mayor Rakowski and Mayor Downing, and they have expressed interest in remaining as our representatives. Motion and a second to reappoint. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed nay. Abstentions. Don't need anybody to tell Ron he got reelected. <laughs> <laughs> tell him he got reelected as the member and the alternate. Yeah, he's got both spots now. All right, uh, next item is item eight, report of the executive director. I have a brief report, thank you. Um, the first thing I wanted to mention is, uh, and you have this flyer at your seat, Stand Up for Transportation. This is an event that's going on uh, on April uh, 9th. This is really to bring attention to uh, the fact that we have insufficient funds where um, uh, concerns transportation infrastructure. There's going to be a rally down at Denver Union Station uh, on April 9th. You're all invited uh, to join. We're going to send out an email with some other information about what all is involved in this and how you can participate even if you're not able to uh, participate in the rally. There are other things that you can do uh, to call attention to this. This is uh, something that's uh, being um, um, uh, sponsored by, uh, in, in large part, by the uh, National, Associa National Association for uh, uh, Transit Agencies. Uh, and Commissioner Partridge wanted to know if he would be provided with a sandwich board. 
A sandwich for board? For <laughs> a sandwich or a sandwich board? Sandwich board. A sandwich board. <laughs> if he will wear it, we will make it. <laughs> um, want to let you know that the board officers, Doug Rex and I met uh, with uh, the transportation um, uh, commission chair, Ed Peterson, and the new CDOT executive director, Shailen Batt, last week. Uh, it was really uh, a meet and greet over lunch. Uh, one of the things that we did talk about um, um, a little, in a little bit detail was um, joining the uh, uh, Metro Area Transportation Commissioners uh, on a um, quote unquote uh, road trip uh, to the West Slope. Um, we all agree that there's value in seeing what uh, other parts of the state are having to deal with uh, with regard to transportation infrastructure uh, and transportation funding shortfalls. Um, plus it's just an opportunity to, to get to know some of the folks um, um, in the rest of the state. Hopefully that would build some unity as well for uh, how we uh, do, um, uh, how, how we go about uh, solving some of our transportation uh, funding problems uh, in the state of Colorado. Uh, Herb was there, Bob was there. I don't know if you guys want to say anything about that meeting. Go ahead. You good? I'll follow they, you. they didn't let me say anything of the meeting, so <laughs> I don't have anything to say here. That's why the meeting only took an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> All right, moving on. Yeah. <laughs> <I'll>, <laughs> yeah. But kind of following up with uh, Jennifer, it was uh, an opportunity to to meet Shailen and uh, to get some of the background that he brings and some of the thoughts that he's starting to gel with. And unfortunately, the weekend that they took him on the road tour <laughs> to convince him there was traffic congestion, they drove from Summit County all the way back to Denver 70 miles an hour with no stop <laughs> and without a police escort. So we had a tough time trying to convince him there really is traffic on the I-70 quarter. <laughs> but I think he has at least in my opinion he has presented a very open atmosphere he's willing to sit down and talk with us to meet with us he has highly recommended that uh, we meet more often than just having a lunch like we did uh, this past week but i think he is realizing the challenge that cdot has here with funding the condition of our roadways and the proposals that are sitting with us today is that no new capacity without managed lanes or tolls and he comes from a very dense uh, populated uh, background where he's had that. He's worked in D.C. Uh, with the Department of Transportation and we're going to try to use some of his connection to make sure that when we open the one roadway that's opening this year that we have the uh, secretary out here so he's already agreed to help us on that and keeping him coming back for next year when we have about six or seven projects that are come to conclusion all around the middle part of the year. So I think we're, we're seeing a, a very good uh, start with a gentleman who wants to cooperate, he wants to be part of what we're doing, and right now I think it's a wait and see. Uh, we can all talk a good game when we come in, but pretty soon the fire hose is going to draw down a little bit and the honeymoon is going to be over and he's going to have to produce and we'll have to see how it does then. Tomorrow. Yeah, tomorrow's not too soon, but yesterday was late. <laughs> Uh, just a couple more things. Uh, Doug Rex and I uh, also attended a meeting in Phoenix of the Intermountain uh, MPOs. Uh, and the, actually, it was a very interesting meeting. Uh, Mark Morrow from uh, the Brookings Institute uh, was there to talk about um, the uh, economies of uh, the Intermountain West. And uh, I know that a lot of you know Mark from um, uh, seeing him at different conferences and whatnot, but um, it, was, it was very interesting, this focus that he has on the Intermountain West. He talked about how we're all doing fairly well coming out of the, uh, the recession. Uh, Las Vegas continues to be a little bit slower than the rest of the Intermountain West in that recovery. Uh, the Denver area has been the fastest uh, of the Intermountain West in reducing unemployment and we're also the top economic uh, performer in the, in the Intermountain West, which that, that was all good news. Uh, he told us a couple of other things, too, that I, I, I wrote down because I thought they were pretty fascinating. Um, he mentioned that the Denver Metro home prices are only 3.2% below uh, pre-recession peak. So to give you some contrast, the nationwide prices are 
22.7 percent below the pre-recession peak. So the Denver metro area has bounced back really, really quickly. And fortunately for us, we didn't bottom out the way a lot of other areas did as well. Uh, he also talked about um, uh, wages. And um, again, uh, in the Denver metro area, the uh, average annual wage is almost uh, $59,400, and compared to the national average, it's just over 50000 So again, the Denver metro area is, is really outpacing the rest of the nation. Uh, we also learned a lot about um, the uh, Maricopa Association of Governments cool tools for those of you who uh, attended the uh, board workshop in February, you saw a lot of things that um, the Dr. Cog IT uh, staff is working on. And um, the Phoenix area Cog has some really neat stuff going on as well. So what we did agree to was that the Intermountain uh, MPOs um, would get their uh, IT and their uh, transportation staff together this coming September to kind of do a show and tell and share. Uh, so we could uh, not reinvent the wheel, so that we could identify some things that maybe um, we could all be doing uh, better and that sort of thing. So it, it was a really good um, meeting. The most interesting thing, though, that I heard from the executive director of MAG was that Maricopa Association of Governments was that their board was complaining that there was, and I quote, too little conflict at the board table. Um, so I, <laughs> I, I thought that was, that was intriguing. Um, I told him that you know, that wasn't a problem for us. We could find conflict pretty easily. <laughs> um, the other thing that I would mention is um, uh, at the April meeting of the board, at least right now, I don't know exactly what will be on the agenda, but I am tentatively planning to do a Dr. Cog 101. I won't take up too much of your time, but I think it's really important as we start talking about um, the Metro Vision Plan and we uh, start talking about how that has historically um, had uh, implications for selecting projects to fund in the Transportation Improvement Program, that everyone get familiar with what Dr. Cog's role is as Regional Planning Commission, as Metropolitan Planning Organization, and as a Council of Governments. Uh, from what I'm hearing, there, there, is some, um, there is some confusion about that. We'll also have uh, legal counsel here if you have questions that I'm unable to answer. But I, I just want to be sure that all of the board is, is on the same page and understands how these things are interrelated and how they're not, how you can choose to make them interrelated if you, uh, if you want to. Um, and then the other thing in, um, that's coming up, and I don't know exactly when or how, but we are going to do a, a tip post-mortem. We talked about this a little bit at the workshop as well, that we want to kind of do a debrief of the good, the bad, the ugly of the existing TIP process and talk about uh, how we might approach uh, TIP, uh, the, the process going forward. We're going to share with you what uh, some of your peer uh, or, uh, MPOs are doing across the nation. Everyone is different. Uh, there is no right or wrong way. There are very few uh, federal regulations that uh, we have to attend to, so it's really kind of what you want to make it. Um, we even have uh, a couple of ideas of our own as to how we might make this more simple for the Dr. Cog board when it comes to project selection and make sure that we're doing a, a good job of attending to the tenets of MetroVision while we are also respecting uh, local community plans and, uh, and community character and, and the desires of, our, of each of our member governments. So again, uh, I don't know exactly how that's going to take place. Uh, we'll either do an ad hoc or we'll do it in MVIC or we'll do it at the board table. I don't know, but I promise you we're going to do a tip postmortem because I know that a lot of you have a lot of thoughts about how we can do this uh, process better going forward. And that's the conclusion of my report. Thank you. Questions or comments on the report of the executive director? Seeing none. Agenda item number nine is a time set aside for public comment. 
up to 45 minutes is set aside for public comment. The same rules apply as for the public hearing, three minutes per speaker. If we cannot accommodate all the people that want to speak within 45 minutes, more time will be allotted at the end of the meeting. I would ask you when you come up to the podium if you would identify yourself and then you have three minutes. Uh, we do ask that there be no public comment on which there has been a public uh, meeting already on that item. So, sir, if you would start out by identifying yourself. Happily. I'm Randall Loeb. I'm a citizen advocate for homeless people in Denver. Um, there's a bill, very controversial, 1264, which is coming before the state legislature on April 8th. It has to do with the right to rest. And I know that CML and many other groups have no interest in supporting it. But that doesn't mean that I'm not going to push as hard as I can to get us to at least think about it. So on behalf of the Colorado uh, Social Legislative Committee, I'm having a listening session at the First Baptist Church at 14th and Grant, and Grant Streets at noon on April 6th, two days before it's heard in the um, State um, uh, Affairs, Military and Veterans Affairs Committee. And um, the sponsors, including from Thornton and Fort Collins, and other places will be present to listen to people's find findings about it. Now one of the aspects of it is that there have been many um, hmm, controversial methods of taking care of us who have no real, real, real place to stay. And so what we're hoping for you to do is put your heads together, and I know you're capable of that, I see some friends around here, to come up with some strategies where we can find places for safe havens, expand the idea of what housing is way beyond what you've even talked about, to making sure that many people who don't have any way to do it have disaster relief services. Now I'm in favor of something called a blue code. That's adopted in the, where I come from, Philadelphia. And what it means is that if a person is unable to take care of him or herself, or it's uh, health or safety because of weather that they have no choice. There's two reasons for this. One, I don't like seeing friends of mine die unnecessarily. And two, it might nudge somebody who has serious problems to get on with their life. That's about all I have to say other than I'm very grateful for your um, being a part of my life. And I hope we can work together. I'm done. Any questions for Mr. Loeb? Thank you very much. Anybody else that would like to address the board? Thank you. Next item is agenda item 10, move to approve the consent agenda. Unless somebody wants to pull something off and specifically chat about it, can I have a motion? So moved. Second. Motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? abstentions. Motion carries. On to the action agenda, agenda item 11, Mr. Morrow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of updates on bills that have been previously discussed and uh, a brief over, uh, brief preview of coming uh, issues in the legislature and then ask we've got three new bills that uh, we'll be asking for the board's support on so the uh, the list in your packet of uh, uh, update on bills there's two that I want to focus on one is uh, House Bill 1033 these are our, our two uh, aging bills that we're spending a lot of time on uh, House Bill 1033 and House Bill 1100 um, House Bill 1033 is the Strategic Planning Group on Aging, and House Bill 1100 is the $4 million increase in state funding for senior services. Both bills have passed out of their first committee and are sitting in appropriations, as many bills like this are doing this time of year. Um, the uh, part of the preview I'll mention now is that uh, 
we're really close to entering into the budget process the, or the long bill part of the budget process. Um, and um, I can tell you that I'm going to be relying a lot on our lobbyists in the back. You, we have uh, Ed Bowditch and Jennifer Castle and George Dibble back there. Um, I'm looking forward to their help in <laughs> monitoring uh, all the craziness that's going to be going on with the budget. Um, we're in reasonably good shape on those bills. The $4 million for the state funding for senior services that are in 1100 is already uh, in a set aside in the budget. So that money's already there. The, uh, on the other hand, where we're going to have some uh, work to do is on, f on getting funding for the strategic planning group on aging. You'll try to get some money from the legislature to help fund the operations of that group. We got, uh, I don't know if it's bad news, but it, to me it sort of felt like bad news today with the March revenue forecast that just came out. And that's the revenue forecast that they will use to determine how much money they have to spend in the budget. And um, depending on which forecast they use, either uh, the governor's number or the legislative council's number, uh, they may actually already be uh, over budget. And they may have to go back and cut some of what they've already done. So we're not sure exactly how that's all going to play out. But it's kind of made me nervous about being <laughs> able to get uh, some of the funding for this planning group. But we're going to be working hard on that. Um, uh, it, and I know that at least we've got the $4 million for increased services, which makes us feel good. Um, with that, I will, unless there are additional questions about any of the, uh, oh, there is one other bill uh, of current bills that I wanted to mention. Today is the day that they finally had the Senate committee hearing on Senate Bill 177. And I told uh, Commissioner Roser that I might call on him since he was there to testify. Um, I think they, are, they may still be going. I think that, <laughs> yeah, I'm getting the thumbs up. They're listening in. They're still having testimony. They started at like 1.30 this afternoon, and they're still having testimony on the bill. So I don't know if you want to add anything, Don. Sorry. Commissioner Roser, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, Rich, they're still going. I was fortunate. I w um, was the fifth person to testify, and I believe I got up at about, 2.30, quarter of 3, so uh, a long day for the, the Senate committee. Um, just so you know, I had that, uh, the honor of, of testifying with um, Commissioner Rapella, uh, Mayor Hancock, and uh, Mayor Murphy. And it, it's great information, um, great discussion item. I'm just thankful that it's um, not set up to fail. Um, day one like it was last year. Yep. Um, this is an uh, issue that we talked about today about TODs, about density, about building, and guess what? We have a hurdle to get over here and that is the way legislation is set up right now, the way law is, it's making it difficult if not impossible to build this type of product and uh, for sale um, product of condos and townhomes. We need to make some changes here and this is one way we have to do it. It has to be a statewide fix. It cannot be a patchwork fix. It has to be statewide. Um, is if it's patchwork, counties such as Jefferson will never be able to do this type of product the way it's set up. Thank you. <laughs> Mayor Cernanet. Rich, I, I have a question on Senate Bill 177, and I, maybe Commissioner Rosier has some, some insight to this. Is um, a good environment in the Senate, and it may get through the Senate. Uh, the question is going to be uh, the holdup possibly with the Speaker. And uh, I've heard not warm thoughts about the Speaker doing the right thing for the communities in Colorado. That's pretty much what I've heard as well. That it's as of now, there's, it, it's still not looking good for the bill in the House. Other questions or comments? Mayor Rakowski. Uh, given that we've had public comment on House Bill 1264, mm -hmm. is there any recommendation from our crack legislative analysis? Rich? Um, uh, I, that I, that is bill? not one of the three bills that I've brought to you today. 
Um, part of it is, um, I think you heard earlier the word controversial. Um, <laughs> not that we necessarily shy away from controversial issues, but um, it's also, um, it, and, and it, obviously the board, we're happy to, to do whatever the board directs us, but um, I think the, the assessment was that it's not, it's, it's more of like a local ordinance kind of issue that uh, Dr. Cog typically hasn't taken positions on, but given, you know, more of the talk that we're having about uh, affordable housing, you know, obviously at the board's discretion on that. And by the way, it's, it's House Bill 1264 is the number on it, if you're interested. Mayor Atchison. It, would we prefer to talk about the new bills in the next section, or you want to talk about those now? Uh, why don't we finish up with any questions or comments on the existing bills? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Vigil. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I just want to make a comment on, on, on the uh, Senate Bill 177. And I think the, the bigger issue right now is the availability of, of this particular condos and townhomes. Uh, I mean, you just can't find them as a, as a realtor out there. It's really tough. And I'll give you an example. Uh, I put up one unit. Uh, up for on the market at three o'clock yesterday. By seven o'clock, it had two showings on it. By twelve o'clock today, I had two offers on it. I had originally estimated th that that unit was probably maybe roughly 165,000. So, being a good realtor, I listed it at 175. I had one offer at 187 on that, and so. That and then they're just driving way up, <laughs> yeah. and so I, I think that's that's the the whole issue here is, you know, I'm still concerned about Senate Bill 177 about the, the the rights of of, of the homeowner, that they might have on there. I still feel that uh, they're they're not being covered in this particular bill itself. It's worse than the last last year's. I'd like last year's better, but uh, the issue again now is that. Uh, uh, I don't know how else we're going to get uh, the developers to, to build them. Uh, and uh, because of supposedly uh, another bill that, as I mentioned last time, was passed back in 2010, uh, dealing with the liability and who's going to cover that and what insurance companies will cover and what won't. But it's, it's, it's a tough issue. But I, I just wanted to kind of mention that the availability out there, I mean, there there's nothing. There, there isn't a single townhome in all of Thornton, North Glen area that, uh, that you can find a townhome or a condo. Uh, you put them up and they're gone immediately. So I'll comment on that real quick. Um, I saw, and I'm, I have to assume that she was quoted correctly, I don't know, but I saw that the Speaker of the House um, yesterday was quoted as saying that she does not believe that it is an appetite issue that there is an appetite for that type of product. Um, and she, she thinks that it is, has nothing to do with that there is a need for that type of product. And that she's not gonna, that's why I, I take it that she's not gonna support it. I can tell you as somebody who has been in the construction and development industry for 30 years, that there's very much an appetite for it. Um, I've quoted this before, but Nationwide, that type of product is about 21 to 23 percent of the overall construction market by volume. In this market, it is two to three percent. And the the uh, example that the mayor pro tem just gave, as as far as over getting a, a market over market price, I think just goes to show that there is very much an appetite for it. Other comments? Well, I, I have a now. question as a follow-up. Knowing that the, uh, the, the speaker uh, isn't looking at the data um, that's out there, um, what can be done uh, to at least move it so that it could come to the floor, possibly have amendments to address the Mayor Pro Tem's issues, uh, but move forward? Because as a community, we're going we're gonna to move forward one way or the other. Is that a question for me? <laughs> I feel I think oh, since uh, we're good, sorry. That's okay. Senator Uliberry out of Adams County is carrying the bill, and I met with him as late as last week. Uh, he has support on the House. Doesn't mean it's going to get to the floor. The chair, the chair is covered. However, 
what we as communities do to tell our representatives down there is crucial to getting them to put the pressure on the speaker to move this thing to the House and let the House decide, not one person. Last year we saw the same tactic. It was double assigned uh, at the end of the session. There was no way it was going to get out of those two committees in the last week. The indication is we may see the same thing happen again this year. It'll get double assigned and it probably assigned to the two kill committees. We as communities, counties, cities, doesn't matter. We have got to put the pressure on our local representation to get this to the floor. If it gets there, I think there's a fair chance that it will pass. And if it passes out of the House, the Senate's going to pass it. I think that's a given. But getting it out of the House is our is stumbling block. And it's only through our own calls to our own representatives is to get this thing to a vote. Commissioner Holland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, one of the issues that I think uh, is not, well, is it's out there, but it's not, it's, it's not considered to the degree that it should be. Uh, th that particularly uh, uh, House Leader is, in, is my, my senator and uh, or my, rep or my uh, representative and I, I am of the opinion that the, the need for upgraded uh, counter development is clearly there it is demonstrated by uh, Val and his, his observations. The other aspect that we, that we should look at is the impact that those um, uh, condominiums uh, have on the entire rent rental market. Right now we're suffer uh, with the increasing rent prices, particularly in, in the more dense areas of the, of the uh, region, um, is locking out a lot of people who uh, would like to move up to more um, uh, more uh, more luxury uh, luxury apartments or uh, better apartments than they're living in, um, and this has an impact on on damming the, that uh, accession um, to to better housing and making available more more available low income housing to people in need. Um, so I think it's something that that uh, we need to we need to broadcast as as best we can to our representatives. Uh, if, if, if it's blocked at the top, nobody is going to find um, uh, affordable uh, housing at the bottom. Other questions or comments on agenda item 11A? Okay, 11B. Okay, so that we have the, the three bills that I have brought before you to ask for positions on. It's House, House Bill uh, 1233 a uh, study of respite care issues, 1235, a, another study, this one on retirement security, and uh, the final one, um, directions for hospitals to work with uh, patients and their caregivers on providing information and training for when the patient uh, returns home to make sure that they're successful when they get home. I'm asking uh, the board for support of these three bills, um, mainly f because they're, they represent pieces of the puzzle that we look at uh, from the AAA, the Area Agency on Aging perspective every day uh, going forward with the aging of the population and the various uh, needs and demands that we're going to see in the economy and, and in uh, state and local government that uh, we think these uh, are, are uh, good ways to uh, start conversations about how to really address these issues going forward. And I think they're also complementary to the larger study group that we're um, advocating for in House Bill 1033. So the recommendation is of staff is to support all three of these. Uh, what I'd like to do, unless somebody wants to pull one of them out and talk specifically to that, is take all three as a single motion. We have a motion and a second to support. I'm, I'm looking at I'm looking at the mayor here whether or not he. A motion on all three I, or individually. All right. Well, we have a motion and a second to support all three of these bills. All those in favor. Aye. Aye. Excuse me. You are correct. Thank you, Mayor. So we have a motion. We we have a motion and a second discussion. So Mayor Sunanik would like to have them separated. 
So the first. The first uh, bill that we're going to talk about then is House Bill 1233. Mayor Cernanek. Use your mic. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, with these, uh, I'd, I'd like to see the, the fiscal notes on these because every time we get task forces named, uh, they end up having a, a draw on the budget. Uh, so they end up going through appropriations on some of this. Yeah. And uh, it's not that I don't think there is uh, a worthy opportunity for education to the legislatures on this but to say and automatically move that to say hey we have to have an appointed body as opposed to where there already is data that exists in many of these areas uh, I, I think is, is a, a, a frivolous use of taxpayer money as opposed to going to sources where there already is existing data on each one of these subjects I guess one question I would ask is do we know timing wise how how quickly we need to take a stand on these and secondly how quickly we might know what the fiscal note is yeah I, in terms of when they're going to be heard um, let me just double check they I think they would be heard at least in their first committee before the next board meeting um, 1233 um, has not is not on the calendar at the moment um, 12 35 I don't have an update on it I don't think it's on the calendar yet either and uh, 1242 is on the calendar for tomorrow I'm yeah 1242 is on the calendar for tomorrow although that's not the, that's not a study and I don't think that one has a state fiscal note or at least not much of one the uh, and I I think the fiscal note I need to double check it I think the fiscal notes are out on both of them and it's like a few hundred thousand dollars it's not a huge amount of money but I mean it's still money well and mayor sir well, and uh, Rich, the, the, the reason why I say this is I find that appointing a study task force is a delay process when there's already an issue that exists from which they can get testimony from experts or folks that are already involved in this field. And what it does is it kicks the can down in either addressing or not addressing the issue. And the question is, is will the legislators have some resolve to actually do something as opposed to kicking the can and spending even several hundred thousand dollars is a wasteful effort. Yeah, I mean, I certainly do, Mr. Chairman, uh, think that that's the intent of the sponsors is that uh, they they not be delay tactics. They want something done, but they feel like the, there needs to be um, a, additional study. I also know that the uh, one uh, 1233 um, is very short, actually. It's it's set up to have its recommendations made by uh, like December 1st I think yeah and um, and so there's a clear intent there with that one that there be recommendations that will be implemented in legislation in the next legislative session with that particular time frame and and the uh, the retirement security one is more of a pure study looking at issues related to um, pension plans and uh, savings and so forth and what people are able or not able to do uh, as they get into their work years and 30s and 40s and 50s even uh, to be in a good financial position when they retire so that they're less likely to access government services because they're more financially secure and it, that, it's that's kind of that that one's intent to do yeah. Let, let, let's uh, let's take action since we separated them. Let's take action on them individually. And, Is there uh, any other any other questions or comments on uh, twelve thirty three? Let me try to tell you real quick. Um, oh, I see. I just hit the wrong one. The twelve thirty three. I'm gonna. I, I think. Let me see if there's if we got a fiscal note. The fiscal note on twelve thirty three is sixteen thousand dollars. One six. So that one's not too bad. Let's look at 1235. Before we look at 1235, let's stay on 1233. So other questions or comments on House Bill 1233? Okay, I would entertain a motion on the staff's position of support on House Bill 1233. So moved. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. aye. <laughs> 
Um, do we need to do we need a hand? Sorry, who opposed? Did you raise your hand? Two. Oh, there's two. Three. Three. Okay. Thank you. House Bill 1235. Go ahead, Rich. Commissioner Roger. Thank you. Um, we have a policy in Jefferson County not taking positions. I can't take a position on, on an item that hasn't been discussed by the board. Uh, as such, I will need to abstain. Thank you. Um, I, I can't take a position on this bill at this time. Thank you. And I neglected to ask that. Are there any other abstentions on 1233? Okay. Thank you, Commissioner Rozier. That still does make the two thirds yeah. for uh, approval. House Bill 1235. Um, it, it does not have the fiscal note up yet, so I don't know what it would cost. <laughs> Mayor Cernanic. Uh On this one, um, this one actually, uh, from my perspective, dates back to the 1970s uh, when we moved from defined benefit plan, uh, defined pension plans, benefit pension plans to uh, contributory plans uh, and the fact that we have the absence of a generation actually experiencing on this space uh, and uh, if they want to know why folks aren't set up for retirement security it's because they haven't saved and uh, if, if they need to form a task force to do this, um, <laughs> I, I, think, I think they are showing a tremendous lack of leadership. Mr. Um, uh, on that point, or at least related to it, is part of the bill uh, calls for this task force to study the um, costs and benefits or pros and cons of establishing a, um, a pension plan kind of a, a statewide pension plan that uh, individual employees who might be working for an employer that doesn't have a pension at the workplace that they could choose to save on their own and participate in this uh, cre other created pension plan. And, That's just and Rich, part I would of that tell plan. you those plans already exist. This is not a space that the legislature right. needs to get involved in unless they're going to take a leadership position and deal with the fiscal responsibility around para. Councilmember Teal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, largely I'm going to uh, echo what we heard from Mayor Cernanek. I mean, uh, again, guys, there's no such thing as a pension in the world unless you're a 20-year uh, veteran in the United States military, for goodness sakes. I suppose we do have some police departments and fire departments that do it. But otherwise, we're talking about I issues of individual responsibility. How many here have been in businesses work for businesses that had a 401k. Of course, that was voluntary. And in latter years, it was all on you, on what you saved. So, no, I, I, I will echo uh, the point made by the mayor uh, in saying, um, I, do, I, would not, I, would, I would advocate we do not support this, uh, largely because um, I don't see how government yeah, our state government getting involved is going to do anything to make it better. Other questions or comments on 1235? Mr. Graves. Point of personal privilege, Mr. Chairman. I ordinarily have a full list of, of Denver's positions for each bill, but I, too, have to abstain from anything I don't have uh, anything formal on, so I'd like the record to reflect abstention for the city of Denver for the bills today. All right. Uh, motion to oppose. We have a motion to oppose, so that is not to take the staff's recommendation, but rather to oppose 1235. I think let's have a hand vote for this. All those in favor of opposing this bill. Those who do not want to oppose, <laughs> double negative. And abstentions.
give us a moment. And the motion to oppose does pass. By the slimmest of margins. By the slimmest of margins. So the uh, the last item is House Bill 1242. Questions or comments on 1242? Anything in particular you would like us to know on this, Mr. Morrow? Uh, just other than my, the, my comments earlier that uh, it designed to help increase the chances that when someone's discharged from the hospital that they're more successful when they get back home so that we can reduce the number of hospital readmittances. Okay. So the recommendation of staff is to support House Bill 1242. Can I have a motion? So moved. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of support, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstained? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morrow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Chair. Mayor Atchison. Thank you. In, in regards to new bills, uh, what I would like to uh, ask the board to look at is on Senate Bill 212. This is one we've been talking about that is coming out of the urban drainage, and this has to do with the detention areas. We do have a bill number on that now that is Senate Bill 212. Sponsorship is by Sonnenberg and Winter. This is concerning a determination that water detention facilities designed to mitigate the adverse effects of stormwater runoff do not materially injure water rights. This bill will free stormwater detention facilities from the costly and unnecessary administration burden to acquire water rights as is currently being proposed by the State Engineer's Office. Uh, from from the city of Westminster, we have taken a position to support this bill. Otherwise, the counties, the municipalities, the special districts, anyone who has a detention area could be forced into purchasing water rights for the amount of water that could be held <coughs> for up to 24 or 72 hours in those, and you get no use of those water rights. So I'm going to ask that the board consider uh, taking a position of support in this bill as it goes forward, and if uh, staff could come back with a recommendation, I would appreciate. Is that a so that is the a motion. So okay, there's a motion and a second discussion. Mayor Pro Tem uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I guess I, I, I want to ask the. We, we, we talked about the 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 the, the uh, job of the Dr. Cog and whether it's our within our mission to get involved in in the water rights and so forth, and I'm. Uh, I, I think that this is something that we're not really equipped to get involved in. Uh, you know, I, I mean, I support the, the, the bill itself, but I'm not sure from the Dr. Cox standpoint. Commissioner Henry. I, I feel the same way. I mean, Adams County has supported it itself, but I don't think Dr. Cog, which is primarily transportation, should be taking a position on water rights. <laughs> Commissioner Partridge. Mayor Pro Tem, I couldn't agree with you more on a water rights issue, but as we I will say to, on the record, Douglas County has taken a position of support on this because we see the effect on transportation projects uh, because it, we have 490, just our unincorporated county has 498 detention ponds ourselves. That doesn't count municipalities, that doesn't count HOA detention ponds, but we see that as a really, as an issue regarding our road and bridge and all of our transportation uh, projects. So I see the, t certainly respect that on water rights, that's, that's a whole different issue, but I see the impact on our transportation projects. Mayor Crispin. Um, I will tie this into transportation. Uh, this bill has been designed to provide stormwater for 72 hours through the High Line Canal if and when Denver Water were to um, change its ownership of the High Line Canal. This is a 66-mile trail and park 
through our metro area that will be destroyed if we cannot get stormwater for 72 hours from time to time on that canal. Thank you. I'm going to ask uh, the executive director to make a comment. Well, this did just become um, officially a bill, and so we haven't looked at it really closely. As Rich uh, has mentioned earlier uh, in the evening, we bring to you those bills that we think are germane to the core business of the organization, growth and development, uh, transportation, and aging related things. So we would uh, discourage you from uh, taking positions on bills that didn't uh, 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 pertain pretty specifically to those, but again, it, this is a new bill. I don't even know if Rich has had time to to look at it to know whether or not uh, it's germane or not. So, um, uh, what I would suggest is is that Rich look at it. He can come back to the next meeting and tell you whether or not he thinks it's germane to uh, Dr. Cog or not. But as as you know, you, in your individual jurisdictions, you can certainly take uh, action on it. Okay. Very good. Uh, Commissioner Holland, did you have your hand up? I will just say, uh, Mr. Chairman, that the uh, uh, county has taken a position of supporting this bill uh, due to the number of detention ponds we have and its impact on transportation as well as uh, development, which is a core element of this, uh, of this organization. Mayor Rakowski. I'd ask the staff to take special note of Mayor Christman's argument, which I oh, find very persuasive. Commissioner Rozier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to tie this back in with the construction defects bill, um, that's legislation that exists that is limiting the ability to develop in a TOD site and develop that type of attached housing. Um, I am a water resource engineer. Every project that we build, we have to have stormwater detention. If you start adding additional costs of having to secure water rights that are unusable, that adds cost. We have discussions here about affordable housing all the time. Guess what? This will add to the cost of housing. This will add to the cost of all development that we do for a zero net outcome. It will add. So we talk, we talk about it all day long here. The cost of roads are going up, the housing. We don't have enough affordable housing, attainable housing. And we're talking about our seniors. Guess what? This adds to the cost of all those. This does here. It's very germane to the discussion that we're having here at the table. And I just want to reiterate that. It's not a side item. It's germane because it affects everything we talk about here. I, w I want to make sure that I understand the motion because if I understand what Mayor Atchison is saying, he is not making a motion for us to take an official position on this bill. He's just asking staff to spend the time to bring back a recommendation. That is correct. Okay. So that is the motion, and I don't know if there was a second. And again, okay, there's a, there's a motion and a second, and again, this is just for the staff to study it and make a recommendation. Councilmember Teal. I'll speak directly to the motion and speak in favor of it. I think, yeah, let's go ahead. Let's have staff uh, take a look at it and come back with a recommendation. I think that's perfectly fair. Other questions or comments? All right, there's a motion and a second. All those in favor of directing staff to look at Senate Bill 212, say aye. Opposed? Abstentions. Thank you. Agenda item 12, Metrovision plan review process. Mr. Calvert. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, everyone. Uh, very quick uh, presentation, uh, but we are we are requesting action on this. This is attachment uh, H in your packet, I believe, page 48 uh, in the PDF. Someone correct me um, if if that's wrong. Um, obviously, staff and stakeholders around the region have been working for quite some time to deliver to this body 
a, a draft of an updated and revised uh, Metro Vision plan. When I say draft, capital D, capital R, capital A, capital F, <laughs> capital T. Um, it really is to land in your hands now to sort of figure out where uh, you want to provide direction. And so one, this is something that we talked about um, at the board workshop, and I hope those folks that participated in a session where we talked about what an effective deliberation process might look like will recognize um, some of the things that we're putting forward you, to you tonight in terms of a, a staff proposal. Um, as I mentioned, we did talk about this um, at the workshop. Uh, everyone that attended the breakout sessions in the afternoon sort of cycled in two sessions uh, to talk about the update. And one of the things that both groups talked about was what would a review process that would be effective and efficient uh, look like. And I hope that these words uh, sound familiar because I promise you they're your words, not, not my words. But this is what we heard loud and clear. Both groups were, were really kind of um, on the same page in terms of what an effective deliberation process would look like to go from review to hopefully something like uh, adoption in the future, what would it look like? Um, let's avoid Groundhog Day, um, particularly between the Metro Vision Issues Committee and the Board of Directors. Um, again, your words, um, not mine. Um, INVIC should stir, serve as a study session and also a recommending board. Let, let, let INVIC spend some time um, on these issues and, and when they feel comfortable forward things uh, up to the board, you know, INVIC's uh, job is to get into the weeds um, on these issues and, and, and when ready and in appropriate, what I sort of call bundles, uh, bring uh, items for the board uh, to take uh, action. But it was very specific and that's the reason I'm here tonight to talk about this is those both groups that met at the workshop suggested that the board should give permission for INVIC to play this role. Just for this very purpose, um, at this, you know, this time around, let's make sure that the board supports that and gives INVIC permission to, to, to play that role. So I looked quickly um, a couple days ago to sort of understand really kind of what the, direction, the directive is uh, related to the Metro Vision Issues Committee. And here's the committee description describes kind of two key responsibilities of that group. It is intended to be the primary policy committee of the Dr. Cog Board of Directors. Um, and, and also its role is to provide recommendations to the board for action on MetroVision issues, plans, and implementation. So the direction at the, at the workshop does tend to, in my opinion, line up pretty well with, with really where the committee uh, description falls in terms of what the direction is for, for how MVIC should operate and what their key responsibilities are. Uh, the, the, the attachment, I mean, the, the, the memo sort of explains kind of what, what we're laying out there as a, as a proposal. And again, it really is directly from the conversation at, at the workshop, but kind of a real quick highlight version. Um, and I sort of said this already to some degree, you know, INVIC will take elements um, of, of the draft plan and through a consensus process direct staff to, to make certain revisions. Um, when, when those revisions get to the point that INVIC is happy, that's when it would get forwarded uh, to, the, to the board for, for further deliberation. Um, one of the things that, that I heard in both sessions was a request that when things come to the board that there's some detail about the INVIC discussion, um, largely to kind of avoid this Groundhog Day moment, so that if an issue was discussed and maybe not advanced, the board would, be, would understand that discussion and maybe either why it went one, one, one way or the other, you would have the full understanding of really kind of what the INVIC discussion was for perhaps um, as long as two hours um, that evening. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, we will bundle those things when it gets to logical points and bring it to the board uh, for your consideration. And when the, when the board is hopefully content and happy uh, with the entire document, really your job will then be uh, to, to forward, uh, to, to release a public review draft uh, so that the public has has chance to comment and give feedback. And then a, f a, few, a few months later, uh, the board will take action on, on, the, on the document. Some other highlights um, that, I, that have really come, uh, come, come up as well that maybe aren't as much in the memo, but just to, to, so that people understand, um, you know, one of the things that we can commit to is that, that prior to an INVIC meeting, because a lot of these issues might be of interest to you and you may not be um, um, an INVIC member, we will make sure the full board understands the issues that are going to be discussed um, at that particular um, INVIC meeting. So if you are interested in attending, just to hear the discussion that you're there so you feel informed when it is your, uh, your opportunity uh, to provide input. Uh, so obviously all members um, and alternates are invited to participate um, in the INVIC conversation, so we will do our best to make sure you're fully aware of what conversations are, are happening uh, the first Wednesday of each month. Um, and just one other quick kind of related thing, just one reminder, I, I think a notice went out on this. Uh, one of the things that we did at the board workshop is to kind of give an orientation session uh, on, on the revised MetroVision uh, document. 
we had a, a six people um, attend the one th this afternoon that were nice enough to spend 50 minutes with me talking very quickly about uh, really kind of where Metro Vision um, is going in terms of, of the draft. And we are ho holding a, another version of that session, which is really a repeat of something that we did um, at the workshop on April 15th at 4.30 p.m. Uh, we wanted to put it sort of an hour in advance of the admin committee because today was at 5.30, so if you were on admin, it was going to be hard to get to that. So um, you received a notice on this, but if you would like to kind of uh, either revisit or hear for the first time, something that to me and in, in our, in our mind will help you um, in your review, we will be doing that um, again at 4.30 on April 15th. And that concludes my presentation. I'm glad to answer any questions. Councilmember Jones. Well, I wanted to make a motion and also make a suggestion. So let me make the suggestion first. Um, one of the things to highlight with the, this process, uh, uh, we talked about this at length at the workshop, and I think this is dead on, is to um, just allow for meaningful public comment at the MVIC process and that it might be actually more useful to have public comment at the end after the discussion um, rather than at the start, I'm sorry, not at the end of the meeting, but at the end of the staff presentation, um, that we might consider doing it that way just so that uh, the public can be responding to what the staff presents. So that's a minor uh, proposal for staff to think about. Um, but I'd like to make a motion to adopt the um, Metro Review, uh, Metro Vision Review process as recommended by staff. We have a motion and a second to approve the Metro Vision plan as recommended by COG staff. Discussion? Mr. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the things we really wanted to bring to everyone's attention is the importance of transparency around timelines for this process. So even if uh, MVIC is going to be the, the sort of committee of jurisdiction is going to do all the heavy lifting, each of us, our various jurisdictions, are we take some time to kind of process internally what kind of feedback, feedback we want to give to. MVIC, and so I think it's critically important that those time frames are very clear so we know when it will be too late to add additional feedback to this process. Mayor O'Brien. Yeah. I'd just like to uh, compliment um, Mr. Calvert and, and his, the whole staff of um, Dr. Cog that <clears throat> spent so much time uh, on this process and in addition to the MVIC uh, committee, uh, have done a great job at it, I think. Uh, Council Member Teal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd actually like to offer an amendment to the motion. Um, we have, um, um, and uh, our, it's really the last bullet, guys. The board has final approval of MetroVision. Adoption of the plan requires a majority of the member representatives. I'd like to offer an amendment to require a two-thirds majority of the member representatives and if a, a second, if seconded, I'd like an opportunity to speak to that amendment. The executive director would like to speak to that. To make that change, that, that the, the articles of association describe how the plan can be adopted and what the vote has to be. You will have to change, and you can, change the articles of association to allow a two-thirds uh, or any change in that. Right now it says, um, uh, that um, it's um, a majority of the member representatives, which would be 29 votes to pass um, the plan. If you want to change that, you have to change the articles, and you have to uh, provide public notice of at least one week in advance in order to change the articles of the association. So you can't change the voting tonight, but you can ask staff bring back an item that would allow you to change the Articles of Association to change the, um, uh, the number of votes necessary to adopt the plan if you want. Well, thank is you very much, Jennifer. Clear as mud? <laughs> uh, actually, that is very clear. I withdraw the amendment. Okay. Other questions and comments? So we have a motion and a second to approve Agenda Item 12. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. Abstentions? Thank you. I, I will uh, ask um, Council Member Teal, would you like to have that brought forward for our next meeting for staff to bring that forward? 
Yes, please, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I would, and, and I just, I look back, guys, on our last uh, uh, vote that we had for the TIP, how um, I think when we, we had the first uh, series of votes, um, it was awfully divisive. We were really separating off into camps. It really took an effort to try to come together, find those compromises, and when we did, and correct me if my math was wrong, we had like two-thirds of a vote in favor of adopting the TIP. So it struck me that once that compromise was achieved, that's where we got to anyhow. I think considering that we want our Metro vision to be a shared vision, um, it would be appropriate to proceed along those lines, at least to have staff come back at, with us on what that would have to look like. Jennifer. So I, I just want to be clear on what you're asking for. And then as it stands today, and as I said, it's um, um, a majority of the member representatives, which would be 29 votes. Um, what, what are you thinking right now that you'd like us to bring back as far as the number of, of votes? There are um, 57 member representatives. It would take 29 votes to pass. So what are you thinking in the way of um, changing the vote so that I bring back language for you to, to consider? <laughs> is that what you're suggesting, two-thirds, which is 38? Yeah, I mean, you're asking me to do math that I haven't done, but thank you. Well, for I'm, I'm, I'm relying on Connie. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it, at the very least, yeah, let's see a plan for what that would look like, and let's debate that on its merits. Okay, so, so staff will bring back uh, to you at the next meeting then um, an item that will uh, to change the uh, Articles of Association requiring a two-thirds vote of the member representatives in order to pass uh, the plan, Metro correct? The Metro Vision Plan, yes, ma'am. Mayor Pertum Veal. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I guess my question was uh, uh, to Connie is what, what, what's the average attendance uh, of the board? So 34, but you know, if you're talking about, so if you're talking about 40, you need 100% of the people here voting in affirmative on a two-thirds. Uh, so it's, it's going to be very, very tough, I think. But, and, but that's why we can have the discussion. And so in the past, what we've done in those situations where we do need a supermajority for something, we've noted that on the agenda that we do need a supermajority. And hopefully that will get people to come out. Okay, I have a number of people, so I will tell you who I have in order. And if you raised your hand and I missed you, raise your hand again. I've got uh, Holen, Penn, Noon, O'Brien. Do we have a second There's on the motion? Yes. We did, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Holen. Uh, my question was already asked. <laughs> Mayor Penn. Uh, my question also was asked already. Thank you. Mayor Noon. So just as a, as a point of the discussion, because right now it's half of the members. It's, it's not half of the members of, of the majority. It's not the majority of the quorum. It's the majority of the membership, right? So perhaps we could do the math of a supermajority of... Yeah. Right, so it could be either way. So just just have those numbers all worked out for discussion purposes would be my my thought because I agree with with um, Mayor Pro Tem Vigil that just having 100% of everyone here could be rather difficult. So, and I and I think we did talk briefly about it before this meeting. So it's I don't want to split hairs too much here, but if if we have a 50% plus one of the attendees or a super majority, excuse me. No, it would be the other way around. 50% plus one of the total members yeah, sure. or a super majority of the attendees, that's going to be almost the same the majority of the time. If we make right. it a super majority of the members, then to Mayor Pro Tem Vigil's, we're, we're probably never going to pass anything. Right. I think we just all needed the numbers. And, yeah. and if you've done the math already, great. It was just to have but, that math. But, but I think to have that in front of us would be good. So thank you. Thank you. Mayor O'Brien. Just a point of clarification, is there a, a motion uh, 
to give direction to staff on the on the floor? There is. Okay. There is a motion and a second. Mayor Cernanek. And I know we will have a discussion of this on its merits at our next meeting, uh, but part of the uh, support I would offer to this is uh, it is meant to be the Denver Metro region's Metro vision uh, that uh, we're all looking to have everyone's or in the water uh, because it's going to require an effort on all of our parts uh, at some at some level to move this forward and to look to just even a two-thirds position as opposed to a consensus uh, is actually something less than what would be ideal. Councilmember Jones. Um, I am more than willing to have this conversation, but I just want to state for the record, I don't think it's the best use of our time. I don't feel like there, that we have a need to do this. Um, if, if some people feel strongly that we need to discuss it, great, but I feel like it's hard enough for us to get good work done here and to set up obstacles is counterproductive. I, I, just given how many people show up here regularly, um, I think we're setting ourselves up to fail. So uh, again, if people feel strongly, I'm happy to discuss it. Um, and, you know, and I support George throwing out the idea, but um, I for one, uh, I don't think it's the best use of our time. Other questions or comments? Commissioner Partridge. Uh, certainly, I think uh, Councilmember Teal brings up a great point because I just look at the Metro vision to be probably a, a very, very important document. No doubt staff has put a lot of time into it in the last three years. Thank you, Brad. And I see a vast importance, probably could be a more important than any piece of legislation we discussed. And with our legislation, we have two thirds of the quorum. So I think it's a very comparable thing and probably even a higher level should it be considered. So I think it's, I support the motion. Jennifer. Two thirds of the, <clears throat> excuse me, two thirds of the quorum is not quite the same as what George said. So again, I just wanna be sure that we're talking, the motion on the table is two thirds of the member representatives of Dr. Cog, not two thirds of the quorum or two thirds of those present and voting. Two thirds of the member representatives of the entire organization, correct? A point of order. The, the motion on the floor is to bring back information. R right, I'm sorry, I'm, you're, you're right. I, I'm just trying to re get straight in my mind what specifically um, uh, George was asking for that, that the motion that we would bring back did and it, it's two-thirds of the full membership. Councilmember Thiel. Yeah, it, that's indeed where this was originally going. I got to tell you, we've had a neat discussion. I would like to see, you know, more of that discussion backed up by some staff support. Therefore, I mean, uh, you know, I, I would be very open to amending that motion to where we have uh, an option that looks at Two thirds of the super, two thirds of the quorum present, as well, so that when we discuss this in our next meeting, um, both options are available. Okay. With, of course, the third option, which is we leave it as it is. Okay. So the motion maker has amended the motion that he would like staff. Okay. Okay. I got about four options here I'll bring back. Tell you what, if we got four options and we can talk about them and we can come to a consensus, I'm way good. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the staff understands the direction that they uh, are asked to go and they will bring back recommendations based on the motion and the second, assuming that it carries. So all those in favor of directing staff? I, I don't know what the proper, I don't understand the motion. I need to have it clarified before we can vote. The, what we are asking staff to do is to look at different scenarios of voting on um, on items, whether or not that is a majority, just a simple majority, a super majority, and if the super majority is just a super majority of those in attendance, 
or a supermajority of all members. Is, yes, excuse, excuse me, that's, this is specifically geared towards our conversation on Metrovision. Mayor Pro Tem uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and I think that the key issue uh, for this whole issue is that we, we, uh, we give a 10-day notice so that we can take the vote either way, whether it's change it or not, right? I think that's the key issue, that there, there be a 10-day notice given uh, when the agenda is published or whatever, so that if we do take an action on it, whether it's up or down, it doesn't make any difference. It's right now, I think uh, uh, Councilman Martil couldn't do anything because there was no 10-day notice. And, and so that goes against it. So that's, that's what I'm gathering from the whole issue of this, not necessarily yeah, we'll have the discussion that we're having now, but we can't make, take a vote until we give a 10-day notice, unless we have a 10-day notice. Council Member Quinn. Uh, I, I'm a little uneasy about this. Something I'd like to see from staff is, what historically have we done? Has it always been a majority? And I'm, forgive me for my lack of institutional memory. And secondly, what do other MPOs do? Jennifer. <laughs> okay. I don't... I don't know that it, I, I want to get into right now what other MPOs do. What I will tell you is the your articles of association very clearly spell out how many votes it takes to pass the Metrovision plan. If you want to change how many votes it takes to pass the Metrovision plan, then you have to change the Articles of Association. You cannot change the Articles of Association without providing a week's notice to the public that you intend to change the Articles. So that's why I was telling uh, uh, George that we can't take a vote on, on how we would um, um, uh, how many votes it would take to pass Metrovision tonight because that would require a change in the Articles of Association and that has not been, has not received um, uh, adequate advertisement. What the articles say right now, and, and we'll spell this all out when we bring it back to you assuming that this motion passes, but what the articles say now is that uh, a majority of the uh, member representatives have to uh, affirmatively pass the plan. That's 29 votes as things stand today. The suggestion, for example, of uh, two-thirds of the member representatives would be 38, 38 votes to pass the plan. Um, uh, two-thirds of the quorum would be something different. Two-thirds of those in attendance would depend on who's here how many people were here. So there are a lot of different ways that you could do it, but you can't, um, you can't make any changes to uh, how the plan is voted on tonight because in order to do that, we have to change the articles. And ironically, to change the articles, we have to have a supermajority. <laughs> Council Member Teal. <laughs> uh, I don't know that that's right. So let me, uh, let me try to speak more like uh, um, a guy who earns a living than a, a, than a politician for a second. Guys, Bob's about to call a vote. Vote yes. There's a lot of knowledge that we do not have on this subject. Okay, we lack knowledge on what's going forward. Tom, you point out something great that, you know, you this is something that hasn't come up in a while. Vote yes. Let's have staff come back. I think Jennifer has a good grasp on where I was wanting to go with this. And let them educate us here at the next meeting so that we can make an informed decision in the weeks to come. And, you know, uh, like Val said, we can have that probably tertiary vote in the, in the next couple months to decide is, is this a measure we want to take to change our Articles of Association. So in a second here, we're going to have a vote. Vote yes. Vote to have a session where we get educated. Jennifer. Uh, and just one more clarification. Uh, to amend the Articles of Association, actually that too requires a majority of the member representatives. So in this case, no, it's actually, oh, is it just uh, yeah, it's an affirmative vote of the majority of member representatives. Uh, uh, so that would be, again, 29, um, oh, 29 votes. So this, this suggestion would be 
uh, require, perhaps requiring more votes to pass the plan than it does to change the articles of the association. But again, if this passes, we'll bring all this information back to you. So I'm not going to try to repeat it all, but I think everybody has a handle on the fact that staff will be bringing back several recommendations or, or information on the recommendation in several formats. Other comments or questions? Mr. Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was just uh, consulting with my, my buddy over here. And he's agreed to accept a friendly to bring back a historic overview of what we've done as well, right? Just to be very clear to your point, right? I think it was uh, Councilman Quinn who, who brought that up. So not just what it would take potentially to amend and those implications, but historically what we've done. Yeah. As long as Mr. Graves never refers to a representative of Denver and a councilman from uh, Castle Rock as buddies. <laughs> done, done. And we're going to arm All wrestle right. right after this. That's right. We're arm wrestling right after this. I accept that friendly. Does, does the second accept? Who was the second? Okay. Okay, we have an amended motion and a second on the floor. I'm going to ask for a hand vote, and this is just to ask staff to bring back the recommendations for us to vote on at the next meeting. So all those in favor of asking staff to perform this for us, please raise your hand. Okay, all those opposed? And it's abstentions? Okay, it passes. Staff will be bringing that back for our review. All right, committee reports. The first report is uh, stack, which uh, Actually, you already did, didn't you? That, that was RTC. I can do oh, RTC. Quick. Excuse me. Three <laughs> items of note that, that occurred at the latest stack meeting. Um, stack recommended adoption of the statewide plan, and I believe that's scheduled to go to the commission tomorrow, right, Deb? For final approval. Um, like us, the uh, CDOT is also preparing their, their transportation improvement program, the statewide transportation improvement program, also referred to as the STIP, um, and, which will incorporate our TIP and they're scheduling a public hearing on April 16th with uh, Transportation Commission approval on May 21st. Um, the last item, there was a presentation on safe routes to school. There was a recent call for projects and projects were awarded. Um, just to let you know uh, who was successful within, our, uh, within, our, within the Dr. Cog area, uh, Boulder Valley Schools, Boulder County, Jeffco Schools, Aurora Public Schools, Well County Health and Environment, and Adams County uh, School District 14. So that's it. Thank, thank you. Uh, Metro Mayor's Caucus, uh, Mayor Noon. There has not been another meeting since um, our report last month, but our meeting will be April 1st. And I just wanted to say we are going to recognize Phil Washington for his service. So we've invited him to the meeting to, uh, to thank him for all he's done for our region. Okay. Metro Area County Commissioners, Commissioner Rozier. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to defer to, uh, I was not at the meeting, so I was going to defer if there is a commissioner here that was, that was at the meeting, if they would like to add. I see Eva shaking her head. Uh, no report, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, Advisory Committee on Aging. Um, Jayla's not here, so I'm not sure if we have a report on that. Does not look like it. Uh, regional air quality, Joyce. We have not met since we last met here. Thank you, Mayor. E470 e Authority, Mayor Rakowski. Uh, just briefly, the last meeting on March 12th uh, had some very positive numbers uh, for the for for 2014, and basically uh, there were 65.5 million transactions. Uh, the budget. Uh, the amount budgeted for operating expenses had a positive uh, uh, savings of over two million, 
and the uh, use of E470 continues to grow. And we're working diligently on the $1.6 billion in outstanding bond debt. Report on fast tracks. I don't see Mr. Van Meter. Is there anyone here that will report on that? See nobody jumping up and down. Uh, informational items, staff is prepared to speak on anything if you would like them to. Otherwise, they are, as they say, informational. Our next meeting is April 15th. 2015 and uh, at 8.57 we're adjourned. Thank you, sir. Oops, I'm sorry. Smash.